Congregation, we're continuing our journey uh, following Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. Uh, we are following along with the apostles, the disciples, as they minister in the early days of uh, the church after Christ's ascension. And so today we are looking at Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. And uh, and this is this is a beautiful and wonderful little story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And this is probably a very familiar story, but there are always things to pull out from Scripture uh, that apply to us today. And hopefully, Lord willing, God will show you some wonderful new insights for you today or remind you of something that you have known uh, and perhaps have forgotten or set aside but can be encouraged in this morning. So, without further ado, let's read our scripture passage for today. Acts chapter 28 verses, or 8, excuse me, Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the pas passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, there, there are a lot of neat things about this passage. First of all, uh, there is the central thing, and that is that Philip teaches the Ethiopian eunuch uh, the gospel. Uh, in such a powerful way that the, the Ethiopian becomes uh, desirous of being baptized. And when he sees water, asks, hey, is there anything stopping me? And, and, and Philip says, basically, no, hey, let's go. Let's do this thing. And, and we believe that, that this is probably... Uh, the foundation of the Ethiopian church, the Coptic church, which is still around and thriving today, not just in Ethiopia, but also throughout the world. And, and this is one of the oldest uh, denominations in the world. And it's a beautiful story. 
And, and what was prompted here is this passage from Isaiah, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And this is a passage that long, long tradition, Christian tradition, has seen <clears throat> as referring to Jesus, the Messiah, that Jesus himself was that lamb to the slaughter. And this is confirmed uh, elsewhere throughout scriptures, including in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is declared uh, to be the lamb who was slain, who takes away the sin of the world. And so Philip unpacks that for them. But there's there's also some other neat stuff here. First of all, uh, the neat thing is that the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip and says to him, hey, go to this road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, <clears throat> if you are familiar with uh, with the geography of that area, you will know that uh, Jerusalem is sort of um, to the uh, to the west of um, of the Dead Sea-ish, um, and then further west, sort of along the Mediterranean, is the Gaza Strip. And uh, if you are uh, heading sort of from Jerusalem to the Gaza Strip, you're heading westward along that road, and you are going um you're going through a pretty arid, dry, desert sort of place. That's why it says the desert road. And, and so, first of all, the Spirit prompts Philip to go there, which is neat. And the Spirit prompts Philip to run up to this chariot. Now, uh, we don't know how fast the chariot was going or anything, but presumably it was going at a pace that was... Um, decent enough that that Philip could run up alongside it. Um, but uh, while he's running alongside this chariot, he notices that uh, the man is reading Isaiah the prophet out loud uh, to himself. And uh, Philip is prompted to ask him about that. After he has explained, uh, it is another wonderful thing that on this desert road, in this arid place, the Ethiopian and Philip uh, and their party or whatever come across some water. Um, it's a desert road, right? There's not a lot of that around. But by God's providence, that water shows up at just the right time. And the Ethiopian is prompted to give his life to God uh, through the act of baptism. And then uh, even more beyond that, uh, that is the most wonderful thing, is that the Ethiopian gives his life to God. But then <clears throat> it's also really cool that uh, a friend of mine and I were talking about this, that uh, Philip is teleported afterwards. Philip is, is transported instantaneously, as far as we can tell, tell from one place to a completely different place. He is transported from this road um, where he is talking to um, the Ethiopian. Uh, instantaneously, he is transported to Azotus, which is in a completely different location along the coast of the Mediterranean. And he goes from there and preaches around in the various towns until eventually he reaches Caesarea. So, teleportation. Pretty cool. But that's not all that's significant about this passage. There is also some significant information here about who the gospel is for. To whom should the gospel be preached? This is absolutely key in this passage. You see, for a couple of reasons. First of all, remember that Early, the disciples kind of thought that the that the the gospel was for the Jewish people, right? They they didn't really get it fully that God wanted them to spread the good news of the gospel to all nations, and that all nations would be blessed through them, 
right? But, but remember with the centurion and his family, they came to know Jesus and became baptized and their whole family came to know the Lord. Uh, so to hear the Ethiopian is not a Jewish person. He is not a Jewish person, but nonetheless, the gospel is for him. But then too, there's more than that at play here. Two. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 23 says. Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 1 says, No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. See, according to the scriptures, according to Deuteronomy, <clears throat> the Ethiopian eunuch was probably not permitted to be part of the assembly, was not permitted to become a, a Jewish person by conversion, not, not permitted to become part of the covenant family by conversion. And yet, clearly, this man has a hungering for that faith, a hungering for knowing God. The Ethiopian eunuch was an outsider, someone who didn't belong, even according to the scriptures themselves. And yet God shows that, that through Jesus, things have changed. Things have changed. And what was unclean is no longer. And those who were rejected are now welcomed with open arms. And this is so important for us. You might think of the Ethiopian eunuch in terms of rejected or oppressed people in our society or around you, or maybe even people who you have a tendency to reject. Right? People who have different priorities in life. People who look different than you. People who smell different than you. People who behave differently from how you behave. But God makes it clear here, both to Philip and to the Ethiopian eunuch and to us, that the gospel doesn't know those limits. The gospel does not reject people based on their plumbing or lack thereof. The gospel does not reject people based on the color of their skin. The gospel does not reject people based on their gender. The gospel does not reject people based on their age or their social status or their economic status or anything. The gospel does not reject people. Sometimes people reject the gospel but the gospel does not reject people. The hands of God offer up the gift of God to all the people of the world. Now, this brings up a couple of things for us. 
First of all, we need to remember what kind of an impact that has had. One of the oldest denominations in the world, the Coptic Church, that is still alive and well 2,000 years later and more, is founded probably by this Ethiopian eunuch and the message that Philip gave him. Not only that, but there are significant biblical texts that scholars rely on that are Coptic in origin. Not only has the Coptic church had that huge influence on Christianity uh, and still is thriving today because Philip was prompted and listened to the Holy Spirit in giving the gospel to someone who didn't belong, but so too we have a lesson for ourselves, a couple of lessons for ourselves. First of all, we have the lesson that we need to be reminded that the gospel is for us, for you, for me. There is nothing so horrible that the good news that the gospel, that God would reject you. There is nothing so horrible that God would reject you. Just as my father-in-law has said on numerous occasions, there is nothing you can do to make God love you any less. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you any more. He just loves you. And so whether there is sin in your past, whether there is something deeply shameful in your past to you, something that you are so embarrassed of or so ashamed of or, or you feel was so horrible no matter what that is, it does not stand in the way of the good news. Remember that. If you think you are pathetic and horrible and not worthy of love, that is just not true. If you think there is something in your past that cannot be forgiven, that is just not true. If you think there is something about you that is so horrible that God could not love you, you are wrong. But then the second lesson about that, of course, is that there is nothing so horrible about anyone else that means that they cannot receive the gospel either. There is no one in this world that the gospel couldn't reach. It doesn't matter what they have done. If they receive and accept the gospel, then they will be forgiven. They will be welcomed home, just as the prodigal son is welcomed home. They will be welcomed home. And then the third thing that we need to remember is that because that is true, because you are loved no matter what your past has been, no matter what you are doing right now, because you are loved by God and because God loves everyone else, then we too are called to love and share the gospel with everyone else with ourselves and with everyone. By this will all people know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. A new command I give you, love one another. 
The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is the Samaritan, is the enemy, is everyone, including yourself. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to remember the lesson of Philip and the eunuch. We need to remember that the gospel is for the outsider, the people who don't belong, that the outsiders are you and me too, that everyone is an outsider. We need to remember that the gospel is given for everyone. That that love of God is for everyone. And we need to remember that because we have received the love of God, then we too are called to give that love to everyone ourselves included, but to all those people who we might be tempted to reject too. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news, and it is for you, and it is for me, and it is for everyone. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to love as you loved us. Help us to love with the self-sacrificing, foot-washing, all-embracing love that you showed. Help us to love the Ethiopian eunuchs in our lives. Help us to love ourselves. Help us most of all to love you, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Oh God, and may you Use us to share that love to all of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.